This morning, we're going to continue through the book of Matthew. And today, we are going to talk about first, last, last, first. First, last, last, first. But before we do, let's pray again together. Oh, Lord, what a privilege, God, to be here. What a hope you've given us, Lord, that this life is not all that there is, Lord. That there's a better place, a better world that's coming for those whose sins are forgiven in you. So, God, help us take heart, take courage today. Lord, help us um, be encouraged by the fact, Lord, that um, some who are first will be last, but some who are last will be first. Lord, so teach us this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have a Bible, you can turn to Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20. Um, The passage today made me think of another passage in the Bible from the book of John. Maybe you remember uh, how the book of John ends. Um, Peter has denied Jesus three times. Three times, Peter, uh, Jesus asks Peter, do you love me? And he says, feed my sheep. Tend my sheep. Feed my lambs. Okay? And as Jesus is, is going, he, has, uh, he goes and he walks along and Peter's walking with Jesus. But then uh, the disciple whom Jesus loved is walking a little bit behind, behind them. We typically think of him as, as John, the author of the gospel. And Jesus tells Peter, he says, Truly I say to you, when you were young... You used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. You know you glorify God in your death? If you're a follower of Jesus. But it was a... It was a uh, a, a, a statement about what sort of death Peter would die. And church tradition says that Peter was crucified upside down for Jesus' name's sake. And after he says that to Peter, Peter looks back at John, who's following behind him, and he says <laughs> he, he's not necessarily too thrilled about what Jesus has just told him. And he says, well, Jesus, what about this guy? What's going to happen to him? And Jesus says, if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. In other words, Jesus says, what does it matter to you what I choose to do with them? What you need to be worried about is what I've called you to do. Follow me. That means God is, Christ is sovereign. He has different plans, different wills, different ways for different people. And what we're responsible for is what he has called us personally, individually to do. That's what we're going to talk about when we talk about first, last, and last, first. If you're able and willing, I invite you to stand in honor of the reading of God's word. We're going to read from Matthew chapter 20, beginning in verse 1. It says, For the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And going out about the third hour, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace and said to them, You go into the vineyard too, and whatever is right, I will give you. So they went, going out again. At about the sixth hour and the ninth hour, he did the same. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing. And he said to them, why do you stand here idle all day? And they said to him, because no one has hired us. And he said to them, you go into the vineyard too. And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the laborers and pay them their wages beginning with the last up to the first. And when those hired about the eleventh hour came, each of them received a denarius. Now, 
When those hired first came, they thought they would receive more. But each of them also received the denarius. And on receiving it, they grumbled at the master of the house, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I'm doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last worker as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? So the last will be first, and the first last. Word of God. You may be seated. I'm going to explore this passage under three headings. Number one, the master's summons. The master's summons. Number two, the master's generosity. The master's generosity. And number three, the master's prerogative. The master's prerogative. First here, the master's summons. So if you look there in verse 1, it says, For the kingdom of heaven is like. And so the, the little word there, for, tells us that this passage is connected to what comes before it. It's, it's some kind of explanation about what comes before it. Okay, And at the end of last week, if you remember, we talked about the rich young ruler and how Jesus tells the, the disciples this shocking Truth that it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter into the kingdom of heaven, and 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 how it's only it's only because God can do the impossible that anybody is saved. And then Peter asks about their reward as his disciples since they had given up everything to follow him, and Jesus says that yes, they will indeed have a great reward because. Anyone who leaves houses, brothers, sisters, father, mother, children, or lands for my name's sake will, in, will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. But then at the end of that passage, he says in verse 30, but many who are first will be last and the last first. And so this, this story then, this parable, is then an explanation of what Jesus meant by that last uh, phrase there, which is why I didn't explain it too much last time. Jesus is now going to give an explanation to his disciples about what he means when he says, the many who are first will be last, and the last first. So that's what, that's what this for means, okay? And, and he, repeats the, he repeats that statement again at the end at verse 16. So the la, in verse 16, so the last will be first and the first last. So this is what this parable is trying to explain, okay? So... Um, how else can we interpret this parable? Well, it, it says there again in verse 1 that the kingdom of heaven is like. So the parable is not is a description of how the first, some are first will be last and last first. And it's also a description of the kingdom of heaven. He's saying this is how it works. This is how the kingdom of heaven is going to work. The way the kingdom of heaven is going to work is that many who are first will be last and the last first. Okay, so, so now what does this mean? If we look at the parable itself, it's pretty straightforward even as it's kind of, um, kind of disconcerting to our sensibilities, okay? The master of the house goes to the market square to hire workers. Not unlike, you know, you go to the Home Depot at 6 in the morning, and you go see a bunch of guys standing there waiting to be picked up for a job, right? Okay? So it's very, it's very similar to that. This guy would come, and he would hire laborers for his vineyard, okay? And so uh, he comes, and he picks some guys up, Okay, and at 6 a.m. probably, and then he sends them to his vineyard. Then he comes back the three hours later, which would be 9 a.m., and then 12 a.m., and then 3 p.m. So each time he's picking up more guys to work in his vineyard, okay, until it says the 11th hour, which would have been about 5 p.m., okay? And he goes there, and he still has, there's still guys standing around. And he's like, well, what have you been doing all day? Why are you just standing here doing nothing all day? And he says, well, and they say, well, nobody's hired us. And he says, well, you go to my vineyard. Okay? So, we don't want to read too much into a parable. Most parables only have one main point, so you don't want to read too much into the details. You might arrive at conclusions that Jesus didn't intend. But I think there's some biblical truths so far worth, worth uh, stating that we can kind of uh, point to here. Okay? What is, what is uh, interesting here, and, and what I want to point out here, is that this uh, master keeps going back to find more people 
to work in his vineyard. And so one of, the, one of the principles I think that we can legitimately draw from this parable is that Jesus or God is in the, is in the business of going and gathering people to work in his vineyard. Jesus is in the business of calling people to labor for him. He goes and he gives the call and the people come and they, they work for him. The disciples, the disciples were the first. He goes and he calls them. He says, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Follow me. I got a job for you to do. Okay, And just like the rich young ruler that we talked about last week, right? He said, if you would be perfect, if you would be whole, if you would be complete, sell all that you have, give to the poor, and come follow me. But he did what? He did not, that rich young ruler that we talked about last week, did not respond to the master's summons, to the master's call. The disciples were the first. I doubt that they fully understood that so far there has been 2,000 plus years of Christian history that have followed the disciples. Okay? Of God doing what? Of God calling laborers into his harvest. There are Christians on every continent on the planet. There are people who worship Jesus Christ as Lord all over the world. Because because God sends out his call into the world and people respond to that call. They hear the master's summons and they come. And Jesus wanted his disciples to know that just because you're first doesn't mean you're the greatest. And just because you're last doesn't mean you're the best either. Some who are first will be last and some who are last will be first. The question will be, did you heed the master's summons? Did you, did you, Jesus said, uh, he said, uh, come after me, take my yoke upon you, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light, and you'll find rest for your souls. Well, what is that? What do you do with a yoke? Well, you work. Following Jesus doesn't mean you don't work, but it's a different kind of work. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. And you'll find rest for your souls. Okay? So when Jesus calls us to work, the question is, are we going to put, are we going to put Jesus' yoke upon us? Are we going to serve him, right? Jesus said you can't serve two masters. You're always serving something. In one case, he says you can't serve God and money. Right? You can only serve one thing as ultimate. And who are you serving? Do we hear the master's summons? Are we listening to the master's call? Some are called, like the disciples, early in history, some later in history. Some are called when they're young. And they serve the Lord all their life. And you better pray that that's your children and your grandchildren. Amen. Yes. That he would spare them the bad decisions that we made. Some he calls later in life. Sometimes when they have few days left and they weep at how much they wasted and how little time they had to serve their master. But time matters little to God. If you serve him with all your heart for two weeks, who's to say he couldn't use that in ways you can't possibly imagine? The question is, do you hear the call and are you obedient and are you going into his vineyard to serve him? Today, the master is calling. He is summoning laborers laborers into his harvest. And so maybe you're in here this morning and you've been serving anything and everything besides Jesus. He's a better master. And so I, I pray that you would begin to serve him today. That's the master's summons. That's the master's call. Number one. The master's summons. Number two, the master's generosity. The master's generosity. He came, says, when evening came in verse eight, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last up to the first. And when those hired about the 11th hour came, each of them received a denarius. 
You see, the second you read that, you, you already know what's going to happen. Because you know what you would do. Am I right or am I wrong? He does something strange. That's strange. He calls the workers last who came last into the vineyard and he pays them first. That's kind of weird. And then our eyebrows just shimmy up to the top of our head when we realize that he pays those 11th hour workers a denarius. An entire day's wage for working one hour. Working one hour. You don't have to go any further to see, I think, what is the main point of this parable. And that is, this master, the most remarkable of all masters, gives to many people much more than they deserve. Bible scholar R.T. France said, No one receives less than they deserve. But some receive far more. You see, the glory of the grace of God is that God does no one wrong, ever. God has never wronged anybody. He does not judge people more than they deserve. But in fact, virtually opposite from that, he almost always gives people more than they deserve. In a positive sense. God woke up seven and a half billion people this morning. He didn't have to do that. In varying degrees and in various ways, he has given to us friends, family, loved ones, food, clothing, shelter, our needs, many of our wants. And the majority of the people in the world today who he woke up will not give a second thought to God. Some of them will be an active and Conscious opposition and rejection of him. And God makes the sun shine upon them and puts food in their stomachs. God gives, God gives to people more than they deserve. And that's just from an earthly perspective. Let's talk about eternal spiritual realities. The Bible says everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. The Bible says that God has shown his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Now, we just, we, I feel like we've, we know that verse so well that we just, we don't think about what that means. You like to help good people. You like to do good to good people. When's the last time you went out of your way to sacrifice of yourself to do something good for someone who you thought was bad? That's what God did for you. You weren't a saint. You were a sinner. When Christ died for you. It says, it says that Jesus died to justify the ungodly. He justified the ungodly. If you're a godly person, Christ didn't die to justify you. Because you don't need it. Raise your hand if that's you. That was a trick question. There's no godly people. Why? That's, why? that's why Christ had to come to justify the ungodly. Because there's no such thing as a godly person, right? No one understands. None is righteous. No, not one. Romans 3. No one understands. No one seeks for God. At the right time, he who, who knew no sin became sin. So that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The glory of heaven is that there will not be a single person there who deserves it. That's 
what makes heaven so great. We're all latecomers to Jesus Christ. We're all a day late and a dollar short. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. God is a generous God. That's the only way anybody is saved. It's because God's a generous God. If God gave us what we deserve, we'd all go to hell. So beware despising the generosity of God. And this is what I mean. Think about those 11th hour folks. You see, when those 11th hour folks get a denarius, we imagine ourselves as the all day laborers and we just like, that ain't right. But let me tell you something. What if you were the 11th hour folk? Let's, let's, uh, let's speculate a little bit. These men that woke up that morning, they're hungry. Their families are hungry. This is 2,000 years ago, folks. You don't work, you don't eat. By the way, that's what the Bible says. If you don't work, you shouldn't eat. They've been working all day. They showed up hoping to get a job, and it's not until this man. And, been, and I, hey, we got to give them credit. They hung in there 11 hours for somebody to get them a job. And this guy finally comes and hires them. And, and they say, um, and he says, one hour, go work in my vineyard. And maybe they just think, you know, hey, an hour's, an hour's pay is better than going home empty-handed. So I'm going to go and work in this man's vineyard. And so they go. And pay time rolls around. And they're called up and they go. And they're just like, well, you know, maybe I'll get something, you know, just, just a little bit of something to, to, to give my kids a little bit of something to eat. And then the man pulls out a whole day's wage and puts it in their hand. And they can't believe it. Because who would do that? Who would pay somebody a whole day's wage for an hour of work? Only somebody who's really rich and really generous. Yes. And you see, it's the people who worked all it's not only the people who worked all day who knows that what happened wasn't fair. It's the people who worked for one hour who know it wasn't fair. They got more than they deserved. And you know what? I bet they were unbelievably grateful for what that man did for them. You see, that's the glory of grace. The glory of grace is that it's not fair. That's what makes grace grace, right? We deserve one thing and God gives us something else. We deserve hell and God gives us heaven. Why? Because of grace. It's absurd. It doesn't even make sense. But that's how rich God is. When God gives, we gain and he loses nothing. And so, maybe there's someone here this morning and you feel like, it's, you feel like you're in the 11th hour of your life. I just want to say, it's not too late to enter the vineyard. It's not too late to enter the vineyard. God can reward you for an hour's work more than the devil will pay you in a thousand years. He's a generous master. But you've got to stop working for the old master. Stop being idle and come into the vineyard. Start working for Jesus. He's a generous master. So number one, the master's summons. Number two, the master's generosity. And finally, number three, the master's prerogative. It says, now when those hired first came, they thought they would receive more. But each of them also received the denarius. And on receiving it, they grumbled at the master of the house. 
saying, These last worked only one hour, and you've made them equal to us who burned the, who've borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to them, Friend, I'm doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me to work for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last worker as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? So the last will be first, and the first last. You know, it's strange here, and again, it's just a parable. You can't read too much into it. But you know, the master could have avoided all this by just paying the last workers last. Everyone else just would have gone home. But it seems like there's a, there was a point to be made. He intentionally chooses to pay the last workers first, which naturally raises the expectations of those who worked all day. And the most indicting thing about this passage is virtually all of us resonate with the grumbling workers. But that tells us more about ourselves than it does about God. You see, a, a, a de, the workers, in, in fact, agreed to be paid a denarius a day because a denarius wasn't an unfair wage. It was the standard daily wage for a day, day labor, fair pay for fair work. The early workers would have been perfectly happy to take home a denarius if he hadn't have paid the one who worked one hour the same thing. They wouldn't have even thought twice about it. So what does that mean? It means they were upset not because they were given less than they deserve. They were upset because someone else was given more than they deserve. Mm, That's the danger of entitlement, greed, jealousy. They weren't upset because they were treated unfairly. They were upset because... The master's grace overflowed to others. And they scorned that grace. They begrudged the master's generosity. They couldn't stand the thought that the master would give the same thing to someone else as they were given that, uh, to someone that, that they thought didn't deserve it. And at the human level, sadly, this feeling comes naturally. Naturally. But just because it comes naturally doesn't mean it's right. The master says, am I not allowed to do what I want with what belongs to me? God owns it all, church. Amen. Yes. I, read it, I read in the passage earlier today, that, that, that money in your bank account, that's God's money. Yes. You say, well, I work for that money. Yeah, who gave you that job? why can you get up in the morning when some people couldn't even get out of bed this morning? Did you do that? Did God do that? Everything belongs to God. God can do whatever God wants with God's stuff. And if God wants to give to so-and-so a person something and it doesn't make sense to you, Well, that's fine. It doesn't have to make sense to you, but you better trust God with it. And if God blesses somebody who you think doesn't deserve that kind of blessing, you better say, God, I thank you that you blessed them. And bless me too. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. God is doing no one any wrong. It doesn't mean people aren't accountable, right? Another place the Bible says, to to whom much is given, much is required, right? So if God gives certain people a lot of things, well, now they're accountable to God for that and how they stewarded that, right? God may be helping you out by not entrusting more to you because you might waste it if he gave it to you. But jealousy, envy, greed is something we all must beware It says, when it says, the ESV says, uh, he says, why do you begrudge my generosity? But the Greek literally reads, is your eye, it literally reads this, is your eye evil because I am good? 
evil eye is a Hebrew idiom, a Hebrew expression for jealousy, envy, greed. What this means is what? It's what we've been talking about a lot recently. What this means is that the grace of God is scandalous, right? Everybody in this room this morning is getting better than they deserve. That's the scandal of grace. The scandal of grace is that there are people who you will think will be worse than you who will get better than they deserve. Right? That's the glory of grace. As the song goes, the vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let the people Rejoice. Come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give Him the glory. Great things He has done. Is it fair that the vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus apart receives? No, it's not fair. But it's grace. And if you can spurn the grace that God shows someone else, you don't deserve it yourself. Grace is what? Grace is a murderer and a persecutor of the church being forgiven and changed and used by God to change the world, the Apostle Paul. Grace is a slave trader who was wrecked by the grace of God and who became a pastor and theologian and knew what he was talking about when he said, amazing grace, how sweet this is. Grace is a man who could lose his entire life's fortune in the great Chicago fire of 1881, who could lose all four of his daughters in a shipwreck two years later, and then write these words, when peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, It is well. It is well with my soul. Grace is the thief hanging by Jesus on the cross who had no way whatsoever to right the wrong he had done. And yet Jesus looked him in the eye and says, Today you will be with me in paradise. Well, now let's just, let's just, let's say that you were the person that thief stole from. Is that fair? If we want grace from God, we have to be glad when he shows it to others. Remember the story of the prodigal son? This is basically the same story. The younger son took his his share of the possessions, goes and wasted all the money, acted worthlessly. Till finally one day he came to his senses and came groveling home. I think most of us, if we're honest, we wouldn't be the dad in the story. We'd be the older brother. You blew it, boy. Get out of here. Don't show your face around here anymore. You wasted all of dad's goods. But that's not what God does. He's out there looking. Looking for his boy's head to come back over the hill. Looking for him to come back. So he can throw a party for his son. Is that what the son deserves? No, but that's what God gives his children. When we turn from our sins and trust in him. The older brother, he despised the father's grace. He didn't get it. But if you're the younger son, you get it. It's me. I'm the one. Who blew it. But God gives me more than I deserve. Why can God do that? 
Because God owns it all. And he does what he wants with his stuff. So if he wants to have mercy on a lost and broken soul, guess what? He can do it. There's more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who comes home than over a hundred who never stray. Thank God for grace. It's the master's prerogative. So we're going to close this morning. But as we do, I just want to extend this invitation. You've never met anybody generous like the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And if you come to him today, as I always say, it doesn't matter what you've done or how long you've done it. There's mercy for you at the foot of the cross. He who died and rose from the dead and who's coming back one day, he'll forgive you if you come to him in faith. He'll put a yoke upon you that is a lot lighter than Satan's, a lot easier to carry, a lot sweeter to bear. And he'll put you to work in his vineyard and you'll begin to produce fruit that you never thought possible. And at the end of your days, he will, pay you, he will pay you a fair wage. In fact, it'll probably be more than you deserve. And we'll rejoice together in it. So that's the invitation today. Come to Christ and be saved. Let's pray. Father.